The, the piece was written in 1742, or it was premiered in 1742 in Dublin. And, you know, besides Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, I can't think of any other piece in the repertoire that has such a strong, like, worldwide yearly tradition. And it's, it's interesting in different parts of the world and also in different parts of the country, different cities have different traditions. Sometimes it's, um, it's performed more around the holiday season, around Christmas time, and other times it's more of an Easter tradition for mm -hmm. a lot of, um, a lot of uh, different places around the world. Uh, it has been one of the longer running traditions at the Utah Symphony. We found archival evidence that the first one was likely in 1978, so well over 40 years. I knew that so many Utah families and Utah individuals had made this sing-in a part of their holidays for so long that we couldn't ignore that tradition. We couldn't skip it for the year. As the radio say, a pandemic's not gonna stop this tradition. So the original idea was, let's just do a virtual hallelujah chorus. And then it grew into something a little bit bigger to do um, about it, this, this 40 minute small Messiah. It also gives a great opportunity for our resident artists still to perform one of the solos rather than the two or three. And then we chose some of the most favorite choruses. And of course we had to end with hallelujah chorus. together after so many months apart was a, a huge uh, blessing um, and we didn't think we would get to do anything like this in looking at what our performing parameters are putting a chorus on stage really is not possible right now and we were really missing it um, singing in a chorus is a very social thing and this group of people they love to be together this is a big part of their lives um, as humans, as being artists. And so just the sheer fact of doing this was great. It's a lot different than how we, we normally do it. So what I did was I met separately beforehand with Michaela, the chorus master, and then with Carol and the resident artists. And we talked about um, tempos of each movement and certain stylistic things. And particularly for the resident artists in almost each one of their, the solo numbers, there's a bar here or there where something usually traditionally happens. And when you're in the moment in a live performance, part of my job is to follow the soloist and communicate together with him or her mm -hmm. to be able to coordinate everything. But since we did these things separately, basically we kind of came to an agreement on how all of these things would look. And then I had a, a separate session with the orchestra alone and I did my best to match the tempos and exactly all of those things that we had talked about beforehand. And then what they did was they created what's called a click track, which is like a, it's an audio file that has clicks on every beat so everybody can kind of stay together. So once we had the orchestra kind of track laid down, then they created the click track and then the chorus members and the soloist were able to perform their part and ha record it separately while listening to the click track in their ear. The footage originated, uh, we, took, we took the recording footage of the orchestra separately and then the, the, uh, artist, the singing artists 
at a Robin Hill Hall, but uh, one of my creative ideas, and it's it's fun to watch it come together, was to invite the community to submit videos. We've all seen those uh, videos that people are making of virtual choirs, and we're doing our own spin on a virtual choir by inviting members of our community to submit themselves singing the Holly Accords from their homes with their families or with their quarantine, or in many cases, uh, singing alone. So it's going to be fun to put that together over the next week. Oh, it's great. Oh,